Lawyers of Reddit. Has any client ever made you go how the fuck am I supposed to defend you? And if so, how did it go? My client gave a textbook perfect confession to a robbery the police had no leads on. He had walked into the police station and told the front desk that he thought the cops were looking for him. He then volunteered that he and a friend robbed a gas station last week. Then, after police arrested and warned him, right to silence etc. And after he spoke at length with counsel, not me, he repeated his confession in an audio slash video statement. He wasn't forced or coerced. He hadn't been detained for an unreasonable time in cells first. They hadn't even interrogated him. But as a result of his confession, they were able to get a DNA warrant and matched him to blood, swabbed at the scene. And the best part? The police had no idea beforehand that it was him. My client and his friend had covered part of their faces. The surveillance video was horrible quality. And they had bear sprayed the store clerk, a 16 year old kid, immediately upon entering. So the kid hadn't been able to provide the police with his description beyond two males. And since he had no criminal record, he wasn't in the DNA database from previous crimes. He had just heard a rumor that police were investigating and assumed they knew it was him. I had to laugh when I got the police report and read all of this. I then focused on securing him as fair plea deal because he had no chance at an acquittal. I'm a criminal defense guy, so I have had plenty. Most infuriating one was a guy that got busted for selling rocks to a confidential informant. The CI was wired for sound and video, so the whole transaction is crystal clear. Plus the cop cited his car as the one that drove up the scene, and he was stopped a couple of hours later with the buy money in his possession, serial numbers were recorded. He had three prior convictions for cocaine sales. The prosecutor offered him five which was the mandatory minimum. He absolutely declined to even consider a plea, insisted on a jury trial, insisted on taking the stand and telling a ridiculous story about how it wasn't him in the video, there wasn't any doubt. I felt like Lionel Hutz trying to string together a closing argument with a straight face. He got 20 years. I had a family client whose ex wasn't letting him see his kid, so we were in court with him explaining how important parenting was to him how much he loved being a father, etc. After 45 minutes of this the mother says back quote I don't know why he's saying this. He abandoned his other kids. Kumi who has never heard him mention having other kids. Turned out, yeah, 100% abandoned them. Has had no contact for years. Never made any efforts. Please give your lawyers important information, especially if another party involved knows your secrets. I have a part-time job as a court bailiff and hate standing in court for these. In a recent case, the father was arguing that he wanted additional visitation and joined custody, which had previously been granted solely to the mother. The judge asked the father a whole host of questions about his kid, who is his teacher, who is the school principal, who is his pediatrician, when was the last time he went to the doctor, dude didn't know anything, but said it was because the mother hadn't told him. Mother knew all answers and had text messages to prove that she'd offered any and all information to the father and he responded by cursing her out. Telling her not to text him unless he asks a question about the kid. Not only did he not get joint custody, his visitation was reduced to whatever the mother wanted. Since he admitted that he refused to give their kid a prescribed medication when he had him because the father had decided he didn't need it. So he'd just throw it away. Causing the mother to have to get more if she sent it with her son. The father was the only one in the room who was surprised. At a deposition. It's the questioning lawyer's responsibility to ask the right questions to get the info he or she is after. And the lawyer has to be thorough and methodical. If they neglect to ask about something, that's their problem. Those defending the witness always tell the witness not to volunteer information and to just respond to the questioning lawyer's questions. Again, don't volunteer. I had a witness come in and we went through the whole preparation meeting where I gave her all the instructions and told her not to volunteer. Again, don't volunteer. I ask if she's reviewed anything to prepare. Nope. So that's good. You have to disclose things you've reviewed. We go through the deposition and she does fine. Questioning lawyer is done. He's packing up his stuff. The court reporter is packing up her stuff. 
and the lawyer is waking toward the door. Witness says did you want to see this, and pulls out a stack of books that no one had ever asked about. She hadn't told me about, and which contained stuff that the other side was able to use. Fucking Dumbus. The client who said they didn't speak English, so we had to get an interpreter. When asked questions the client kept answering in English and the interpreter would have to stop and ask again, and then answer in the language. Long confusing deposition to say the least. The client spoke better English than anything. Ime paralegal. Although imminent now. But previously I was in other areas. Well in court. The case before ours at the time was for theft, and was going on much longer than it should have. Defense lawyer calls for a motion to dismiss. Claiming lack of evidence. Judge says he will entertain said motion after lunch. Hits gavel says court will reconvene at 1 p.m. Court dismissed. Defendant stands up and says real loudly. Told you I could get away with stealing. That should thought his case had been dismissed. It's a toss up between the one who called the judge a cunt to her face and the one who didn't show up for a hearing because, while out on bail, he got arrested in the next county over and was in their lockup at the hearing time. Does that count as an excused absence? I had to try to defend a man who walked into a convenience store with a knife demanding money. He wore no masks just his casual clothes and walked through every aisle before he robbed it being spotted by every security camera in the store. After the robbery he ran back to the hotel he was staying at, also carrying an open backpack full of money, being seen by the hotel's security cameras in the process. He then went into his room through the bag on the floor and hid under a bed until police arrived. I spent a long night thinking about it before passing the case to somebody else because I have no idea how to defend someone who has so much evidence against them. I've told this story here before, but it's a good one. My friend's mom was a defense lawyer for a hospital her job was to represent doctors accused of malpractice or anything relating to doctor slash patient interaction. I forget all of the details, but she had one case where a female patient had accused a male doctor of sexual assault. The claim was that the doctor groped the patient several times during a procedure. Allegedly, the doctor had been coached to say that during a routine procedure. It's possible that he had inadvertently brushed up against the patient's chest, and that if it happened, it was an unintentional consequence of following standard procedures. So they get to the deposition. And I guess the first question the doctor gets is something along the lines of, walk me through what happened, and the doctor says, I don't know what you want me to say, man. I'm a tit guy. Always have been. They settled. And meanwhile I worked under a doctor who was accused of sexual harassment during a spinal tap because he pressed his knuckles into her back before inserting the needle and for some reason her mind thought that it was his dick. She really believed this doctor pressed his erect penis against her spine while performing the procedure with a giant needle right next to said dick. They had to have the nurse who was in the room validate that the doctor had not been engaging in frotchurism. Not that phrase. On two different occasions in the last three years, I have declined representation, and in each case it was someone who had been sued, was served with the papers, had completely ignored them, was defaulted, received and ignored the request that the court enter a judgment based on the default, and then ignored subpoenas and other directives relating to creditors' exams. Then it finally occurs to them that they should consult with a lawyer, far too late to do anything. My question. Not spoken out loud, how in the world do you get through life? You wonder how people like that live when they are such idiots. But somehow they manage to stumble into enough food and housing to keep surviving. I'm pretty sure the lawyer who served the girl who sued my brother had that same question for her. My brother started dating the girl right after he and his first fiancé called things off. From the get go this new girl was bast shit. He brought her home to hang out, and she burst into my room without warning to introduce herself, and tried to hang out with me. She told my brother she wanted him to get me, our mom, and our stepdad together downstairs, so we could all meet, and play board games. She found our dad and stepmom on Facebook and friended them. She was the weirdest clingy girl I've ever seen. My brother wasn't looking for that kind of relationship, so he ended it with her. This girl proceeded to fuck with our house his car, his friends, 
she started making calls to the local police saying she'd seen criminal mischief happening and she thought it was my brother. After months of trying to ignore her and hoping she'd go away it didn't work. My brother came home and found her sitting on our porch with this other girl. Apparently they were in a relationship and they wanted my brother to have sex with them and get them pregnant so they could have kids. My brother snapped after months of stalking and basically threatened her with violence if she didn't leave him the hell alone. A few weeks later he got served to show in court to determine an order of protection against him filed by that girl. He didn't bring a lawyer and he didn't expect her to have one. Anyway, her lawyer started talking about how my brother had threatened his client and she felt like she was in danger and how my brother deserved to be locked up. She also tried to have him banned from being near the local elementary schools. For reasons unknown to us, my brother was entitled to call witnesses, so he called our mother, me, our stepdad, and the three friends. Each of us detailed the months of stalking and property destruction. Then my brother presented the photos he had of everything she'd done, the screenshots of messages sent to him, to me, to our relatives, on cell phone and social media. Based on the look on her lawyer's face she hadn't mentioned and had probably lied about it, she'd instigated everything. My brother was given an order of protection against her that she ended up breaking a few weeks later. She moved away after she was released from county jail and last I heard she sells her body for drugs and money. This isn't my story, but is just too perfect to not mention when one of these threads comes up. So we are at a bail hearing for the client. An older guy in his 70s accused of sexually assaulting his granddaughter who is in her teens. We are just wrapping up. Have made all our arguments that the client is an upstanding member of the local immigrant community. No priors. ECT. And the judge has granted bail with a reasonable bond. All done right. No. The client insists he wants to say a few things. So he stands up and gives his bit that he hadn't mentioned to his lawyer at all about how he doesn't get why there is all this fuss. He didn't even penetrate her with his penis after all. And she was asking for it with that short skirt. At this point the judge tries to interrupt this by suggesting that maybe this comment would be better suited for sentencing. But the old guy is dundigging. He just has to tell everyone how he really doesn't know why people are wasting so much time over all of this as he is going to fly back to his home country in a couple of days anyway. So yeah. Apparently that one didn't go well. I went to a meeting where an older couple, 80s, sent their life saving to a Nigerian prince, 2009, who was going to triple their money and send it back. They sent money into installments. Grand total was around 40k, and it was obviously stolen. They wanted to know every option they had to get it back. And the answer was simple, none. There's nothing you can do to get your money back. I've never seen two people so mentally broken. They were retired and no longer had access to money in any way. I excused myself from the meeting by faking a call and started crying in the bathroom. I couldn't handle it. My mother-in-law also sent money to a Nigerian prince. We don't ask her how much it was. But it was a lot. Many years ago. She sold her house for quite a lot, had she kept it, and sold it last year instead. She'd have probably gotten way more. But I digress. So her daughter, my sister-in-law, took control of all the money on her behalf. She lent it to herself to pay off her own mortgage. Which is fine, because she paid it back at no interest versus the mortgage interest. At first I thought it was sort of rotten. Taking the money to protect mom from being scammed until I got to know my mother-in-law more and a Nigerian prince payment came to light. Then I understood. Later on, my wife said hey, my mom gave us $500 in Apple iTunes card so if the kids want to buy a movie or something, we can use that. I asked why she gave us such a nice little gift and, yep, someone convinced my MIL that the eyes was after her and that the eyes wants Apple gift cards instead of money. Luckily she actually stopped to think about it and realized it was a scam but had the cards and she gave them to us. She learned from her experience. So that's something. Not many who fall for these scams do. I had a client come in and spin me this yarn about how he owed all these child support arrears and the payments are killing him and could I file a petition to have the payment reduced. He spins this tale of his spouse alienating the children and that's why he never saw them. 
I filed the petition and the clerk called me aside one day and said I might want to review his actual divorce file. Not just his child support file. That was a wild ride. Orders of protection due to stalking. Losing his visitation due to meth use. Not making a single child support payment in 14 years. I do the best I can until he admits on the stand that he smokes a carton a week and drinks over a liter a day. So that's over $200 a week in cigarettes and liquor and a little weed sometimes. It did not go well. I was a baby attorney at the time and I could tell the judge wanted to tear me a new one for even filing this, but I was so beaten down by the end of the hearing that it would have been child abuse at that point. As a PD pretty much every single client that wants to take their case to trial and is completely delusional about how strong their defense is, I don't know if it's drugs, narcissism, mental illness but so many just are in complete denial, even when you show them the whole thing on video. They don't understand that a witness saying what they saw happened is evidence despite telling me they are being railroaded with no evidence. Especially with strictly ability type offenses like driving under suspension and don't get that I was only driving 3 miles to do X and those cops just wait outside my trailer park waiting for me because they know my car isn't a defense. Often times during discovery you'll get requests for admission. Which are a set of yes or no questions designed to get basic, non-contested info like whether our client was the one driving the car at the time. Often plaintiff's lawyers will throw in a gotcha question that pretty much states admit the whole thing is your fault and you owe plaintiffs a bunch of money. 99.9% of the time we'll deny them because it would sink our whole case. But I had one idiot defendant who insisted on admitting that one. We lost. Sometimes. Pedophiles and fraudsters are often in denial. They'll refuse to enter a plea of guilty, even if the evidence is overwhelming. And even though a plea would substantially reduce their sentence. In those cases you're just put in the position of explaining to the client their low prospects of success. And putting the prosecution case to the test. In a guilty plea, you have the opportunity to explain some mitigating details in the defendant's favor. Very occasionally the defendant is a miserable unrepentant asshole who had every advantage in life and still fucked it up. In those rare cases I'm forced to brush over the defendant's antecedents and focus on making sure the sentence is in range. Teenage boys can be very difficult to work with because they are focused on impressing you. So getting those mitigating details is like extracting teeth. Note, if you are a teenage boy, this doesn't impress us. The actual hardened criminals we deal with have danced the dance many times. And they are forthcoming with details like their difficult upbringing, the courses they've enrolled in and so forth. Fortunately, in the case of teenage boys, their mother often comes with them. So I can ask her for humanizing details like their favorite subject at school, their future plans, how they fell into a bad crowd and so forth. Makes sense for pedophiles. Society hates pedophiles more than anyone. If you're a thief, the victim's family will hate you. A murderer, the victim's family and a bunch of other people will hate you. A rapist, most people will hate you. But you'll probably still have people you can trust. And maybe people won't want to instantly stab you once you get out. If you're a pedophile, every single person on the planet will viscerally hate you as soon as they know that word is linked with your name. Most will want you dead. Many will want to torture you before you die. Once you get out, you're still basically imprisoned from the rest of life. Not geographically, but from people. Makes sense that they would take a 1% chance of freedom and semi-respect over a 0% chance of ever being looked upon favorably ever again. All I can think of is I saw this guy on the TV, Dutch, who was accused of possession of firearms. He didn't have an attorney as he didn't want one. His reason. He didn't need an attorney because what he was doing was actually legal. The judge asked him if he was sure. He said he was. Then he was convicted. That was pretty much it. I'm like 99% sure that the story I'm about to type out didn't actually happen. But your post reminded me of it so I'm sharing. Allegedly there was a guy on trial for armed robbery. And his argument was that he wasn't armed. The prosecutor had testimony from the store clerk saying that there was a bulge in the pocket of his jacket that, in the clerk's eyes, looked like a gun. The defendant asked this jacket and this bulge, indicating the jacket he was wearing. 
and the witness nodded. Then the defendant pulled a 5 kilogram brick of cocaine out of the jacket pocket to prove that it wasn't a weapon. Judge had to call a 5 minute recess due to laughing too hard. I interned at legal aid. Not our client. Custody case. He accused her of using coke all the time which made her an unfit mother. She defended herself. Back quote your honor. I have never used cocaine in my life. And I wouldn't. I only smoke crack case closed. I have posted this here before. I'm not a lawyer. I read about this. Two guys were being tried for robbing a gas station. A customer who saw the robbery was now on the witness stand. The prosecutor asked him to describe what he saw. The witness said that he saw two guys robbing the store and while running out, one of them bumped into him. Then the prosecutor turned towards the two defendants and asked are those two men in the courtroom today? At which point, the two idiots raised their hands. I'm sure the defense lawyer thought how the fuck am I supposed to defend you now? <laughs> lawyer here. My client committed another crime during the trial and judge found out about that. During one of my first divorce trials our client attempted to kill his wife two days into a three day trial. A group of three young boys in my city drowned their neighbor's cat and recorded themselves doing it with their phones. The videos were copied by their friends and would inevitably be shown to the jury in court. It was a case of the evidence speaking for itself. All I could really do was to argue for lighter punishment using their age as defense and the disastrous effect that group mentality can have on young people. P Former criminal defense attorney here. The answer is almost every single one. But keep in mind. You don't defend clients. You make prosecutors do their job. My lawyer father once had a client who was suing the federal government because he claimed his parents had sold him to the feds for testing as a child. The client claimed they had him constantly under surveillance. When asked how he knew who was watching him, the client said the government used minivans and station wagons, late 80s, and they were always parked outside his residence. The client lived in a motel in a resort town. My aunt is a retired lawyer. She once had to defend a guy who was in the possession of weed and other drugs. He swore he didn't have any. But he obviously did, because on the days leading up to his trial he looked and smelled more shittier than the day before. Finally, on the day of his trial he showed up with a cigarette in his mouth and a can of lager. He was high as freak and there was obviously some drugs in his system. My aunt told me as she was retelling this story, as soon as he walked in. I knew it was about time for me to freaking rat your herbs. He lost the case. Even though my aunt tried to get him a lower sentence. I think he's serving like 20 years or something now lol. I work in the legal system. Not a lawyer. Sorry. But this situation is pretty good not to share. A defendant was arrested for a breaking and entering, went into a neighbor's home, after being told not to and sat down, acting like they owned the place, and started smoking a cigarette, if I remember the charging court paperwork correctly, when the police came and proceeded with an arrest. The defendant straight up with no prompting. Said basically oh. And I killed my other neighbor. They didn't have many leads so this pretty much gave them what they needed. I don't know how the defendant's attorney is going to be able to defend with that confession.